must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Pollan, and today I have the esteemed pleasure of talking with a very, very well-known and respected clinician in the field of orthopedic manual physical therapy, as today I have the very distinct pleasure of welcoming Dr. Tim Furon on the show. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, Dr. Tim Furon is the owner of Furon Physical Therapy in Phoenix, Arizona, and he has served as lead faculty for Evidence in Motion Manual Therapy courses, the Clinical Decision-Making class, and Fellowship Virtual Rounds from 2009-2014. Dr. Furon has also served as adjunct faculty at AT Still University, where he taught manual therapy of the spine and extremities at the entry level and in the residency track from 2006 to 2014. And he has taught numerous manual therapy courses over the last 20 years, spoken at numerous meetings for the Arizona Physical Therapy Association and for the APTA. Well, Tim, first and foremost, thank you so much for your dedication to the profession as you've clearly done a lot throughout your career from clinical care to education and much more. And, you know, maybe for our listeners perhaps who don't know much about you, do you think you could mind giving our listeners some background, maybe a little bit more into who you are and kind of your journey of kind of what's gotten you to where you are today? Sure. I'd like to do that because a lot of people uh, meet me and think, uh, wow, I should be that. Well, I should have been that too, but it takes a while to get there. Uh, So I guess my journey, like all of us, start back in, uh, in, in, at that time, undergraduate school. For me, I went to school in the dark ages. It was a bachelor's degree. Uh, So I left with a BS and PT from Ohio State. uh, And it was about two years before I realized that's what I got. I got BS in PT. Uh, because the problem was I was bored. I didn't like the profession. Uh, I found it totally non-stimulating. And then I remembered uh, somebody who I was exposed to when I was doing my uh, my student rotations. That would be Rick Bowling and Dick Earhart in Pittsburgh. And you know what? Those guys were never bored. Those guys were always stimulating and stimulated. And the problem must be me. Uh, So I went to the master's program in musculoskeletal medicine in, uh, in, in PT, I should say, at Northwestern uh, while I was in Chicago. I became a rock star with, with, a, uh, with papers, examinations, oral defenses, et cetera, and my patients were very underwhelmed uh, because what I was doing was I was seeking clinical expertise uh, from, from people who were academically experts, uh, and that's what I was becoming. Uh, so when I uh, realized that, I started seeking out uh, uh, people who were legitimately were uh, clinical experts, people who had been doing this for a long period of time in the clinic. Uh, and I set myself up in uh, two different long-term programs. One was Folsom Physical Therapy. Uh, when they, back in the dark ages, they used to travel. Uh, my group was the last group that they traveled for, uh, and they started to stay home in Folsom. Uh, and that led me to find Barbara Stevens, uh, who was a uh, student of Jeff Maitland. Uh, and I started to bring Barbara Stevens and Margaret Anderson to Phoenix uh, on a routine basis, uh, year round. Uh, the best of which was for me when I realized that the class had taken on a life of its own. Uh, then what I would do is I'd have them come over on Thursday. They'd be in a clinic with me on Friday, me fronting up with my patients uh, before the class would start on Saturday and Sunday. 
So by the time the class came around on Saturday, my class was done uh, because I had uh, spent the time uh, showing them what I was doing, what I wasn't doing. Uh, and they, I should say they showed me what I wasn't doing. Uh, so it was really genuinely apprenticeship style learning to get uh, what I always uh, uh, call the skill set for manual therapy, the application thereof. Everything else I had done prior to that was about gaining the knowledge, the knowledge base doesn't lead to having a skill uh, in doing that. So that's where I started, and, uh, and it took years of uh, legitimate practice before I would uh, uh, actually recognize, that, oh, I'm actually good at this now. <laughs> uh, so everybody, wherever they are right now, and uh, wherever they are in their, their development, should, needs to realize whoever they're looking at as the icon to shoot for, they too took a path to get there. Uh, so you, you can't give it up. And then it's sort of, for me, uh, I think pretty much everybody who's ever had me as, a, as an instructor would say that uh, if you had to force them to give one word to describe me, it would be passionate. Uh, and I think if you don't have that, you can't get good. And so I think uh, for me, it came down to you're either going to get in or you're going to get out, which is it? Uh, mm -hmm. So obviously I got in and I've never looked back. And, uh, and I can really and truly say this. Uh, I'm one of the few people I know who love what they do. I'm damn good at it. And I go to work and I enjoy every day that I go to work. Uh, so I don't want to get old and retire because it took a long time to get there. Uh, and work is fun for me. And I think PT can be uh, fun for virtually everyone in it. I think that's really powerful to kind of hear your story in terms of how you kind of started off again from more of an academic standpoint, learning how to treat patients and then really kind of figuring out that maybe that's not the best way to go about it when you get into the clinic and really finding that there are other people out there that, you know what, they're doing really, really good clinical work in the clinic. I got to go learn from them and I want to get better. It's going to take a lot of work and I got to have some passion to get there. You know, kind of with that, I know, you know, like you said, it's taken a long time um, for you to get that, get to where you are today. But I'm, one thing I'm just really, really curious about, because as we all are clinicians, as we all kind of start out from where we first start off, our clinical reasoning is always evolving. And, you know, something that I'm really curious from your perspective is how has your clinical reasoning evolved kind of specifically overall since you kind of graduated from school and to kind of where you are now and kind of where the future lies for you in terms of your clinical reasoning as it stands now? I think it probably starts uh, like everybody in an infantile version, i.e. out of the textbook. Uh, and then when you get into a circumstance of reality with real patients, uh, that you realize that, geez, uh, you know what, I missed something here. And looking backwards uh, to retrospectively review your own work and see what you've missed, uh, uh, oftentimes it's the irritability of a patient, uh, so therefore you over-examine them, uh, or sometimes it can be the reverse, under-examining them. And I think the, uh, uh, the evolution went from simplistic, sort of binary, black and white, uh, to, oh, no, 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 most patients who walk in the door are gray. And it's my job to find out what shade of gray uh, so they can move forward from there. Uh, and then, of course, you run into these multicolored ones. Uh, and at some point, you have to begin to realize that uh, all the knowledge base has to factor into a skill base of assessing who that human being is and, therefore, how you're best off interfacing with them. Uh, so it's still evolving. I'm far better now at recognizing when I don't need to ask a lot of subjective questions uh, and when I can get right to what I call the Norwegian approach, show me, uh, and the, uh, the times when it's going to be better off if I really sit down and don't worry about being a manual therapist and worry about being present to that particular individual at that point in time. So in other words, they don't care what I know uh, until they know that I care. That's a very, very powerful point. And I think that's a very, very strong quote. That's very, very prevalent throughout. So, and I agree. I mean, I've only been out for three years. How much really is important also too on the subjective component rather than objective? Because when I first started off, I was not as much subjective and more objective. Yeah. And I think that's a common thing across the boards as well. Because I mean, frankly, I mean, I didn't know any better. I thought I had to collect all this data. And, you know, and I think you bring up the good point that, you know, there's times and cases for that, but there's times and cases not to do that. And really being able to pick out 
who's the right person to do for that and who's not, who doesn't maybe need that. That's where that true level of mastery. Is. Here's a good time to add this in. And that is that uh, in my tutelage along the way, uh, uh, when Barbara Stevens was coming over for a, a day in a clinic with me, uh, she sort of asked me, uh, well, what's your question? And I thought, well, uh, about which patient? Uh, so I started rattling through each of the patients that I was going to see. And she looked at me and said, your subjective examination is poor. And I thought, it is not, right? She said, I'll show you. And it's, okay, why would you say that? Because you can't articulate the problem you're trying to solve with any person that you just told me about. So we came into clinic that day. She never touched anybody. She asked a series of salient questions and then told me exactly what I needed to do. And she was right all day. So by the end of that day, I realized that, okay, if I don't have that skill set to that degree, I won't use it, right? And because of that, uh, I developed a skill set that I think a lot of us are ignorant to until you really see it set in play. Uh, so I'm a big advocate of it, but I'm also a big advocate of understanding when I've asked the last necessary subjective question and when it becomes time to ask the next best question by asking objectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think those are some really good points. And of course, you know, Tim, with your experience with teaching manual therapy and kind of different psychomotor skills, you know, of course, not limited to soft tissue, joint mobilizations, high velocity alignment through thrust techniques, needling and others. We start off initially doing anything as novices. And, you know, we may not be very good initially at doing that. I think that's definitely normal. But I'm kind of curious for you in terms of what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned with skill development, with learning? I think let's stick with thrust because everybody will understand, I think, uh, what we're both talking about. And that is that uh, uh, when you first learn to thrust, it's very mechanized. Uh, so uh, you're told, for example, let's stick with the cervical spine for a moment uh, that, okay, uh, coupling is in this fashion. So we're going to do a little bit of reverse coupling in order to get uh, the appropriate line of drive to move it. So if I'm going to side bend the neck to the left, I'm going to rotate it right. And I'm going to go to that particular level and I set it up and I look for the, the clean line and I look for an end feel. Uh, and, and then I decide when I'm going to do a thrust. And it's kind of the only way to really learn that. But in reality, uh, what you do there is you set up this scenario with the patient where uh, it's like a, this big deal and they're anticipating, whoa, and something's going to happen. And so are we, right? And the reality of it should be that it happens in a flow. It happens when you're doing the things that are appropriate for that patient at that given point in time and the thrust happens. But I always look at the thrust as being an intervention in order to enable rehab. Mm -hmm. And the rehab is to in order, in order to enable management. And if you don't move backwards and see the big picture, uh, then you get caught uh, into being what I call an interventionalist. Mm -hmm. So, for example, everybody is aware with the uh, uh, PM and R physicians nowadays, man, they're just needle jockeys. Uh, the needles are sharpened before the patient arrives. They become very good at doing that because that's what the remuneration is. Uh, they are not going through a process like we've got the whole from the patient from the beginning. That is that they come in with a problem and what they really want. Here's what every patient really wants to get done with PT. Right. And if all we do is become really good as an interventionist and never drive them towards the whole picture, i.e. then rehab, then management prophylaxis, see again, if you get injured again, uh, then we fall short on that. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way to really do that, you got to see it modeled. Mm -hmm. And there's very few people that uh, uh, that model it well, the whole practice. Uh, and I think everybody who's listening to this right now needs to find somebody that's convenient. Uh, you can't all come to my door. Uh, uh, but somebody that's there that you, can, that you feel you have a, a good relationship with, you can identify that this individual is a good practitioner. And to spend time watching it actually happen as opposed to, uh, I, and I shouldn't say as opposed to, the novitiate, you must learn the mechanization. But then as you uh, aspire to be a, a, an integrating master clinician, what you've got to be able to do is exactly that. Mm -hmm. Integrate it, and you've got to know what it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful. And I think even since like me first learning, when I first started doing it, I kind of honestly just was the one who was doing it more mechanistically. 
and I'd reflect and really become self-aware. I'm like, what could I have done better next time? What did I not do? What did I do? I didn't get that right. I didn't get it to that point. I wasn't quick enough. I didn't get, you know, and I learn, okay, so next time when I do that, I'm going to do that again. I'm going to do this. Okay. Now that's not that bad. Now I'm going to kind of work on focus. Now that I've got that, that part down much better. Now I'm going to start to work at more of a normal flow. So I, yeah, I think uh, I agree with that in terms of how to really integrate it, but also it's not bad to separate it if you feel like you need to. I think at the beginning you have to, but you just described metacognition and intellectual honesty very nicely. And anybody who's honest, I don't care how good they are at thrust manipulations now, will admit that they had to start the same place you're describing it right now. Uh, and you don't get there without practice. It's a psychomotor skill. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're talking about manipulation, but everything is. Frankly, and I want to say this, I want everybody to hear this, I think it's far easier to teach people to become a good manipulator than it is to teach them to become a good mobilizer. It's not by accident that there's more research about manipulation. It's easier to standardize. It's very difficult to standardize how Brandon's hands are feeling, what they're doing with that particular body, with that particular joint, with that particular end feel, and how they're interfacing with the resistance as compared to how Tim is doing that. Right? And I think teaching that is a much more difficult skill set. Hence, people want to do uh, a lot more manipulating. And sometimes... Uh, it isn't the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. I do think it's a first base step. It gets you to the yeah. next step. Right. And that's kind of what you said earlier. It's, it's really meant to enable rehab, enable Correct. movement, enable that next level, whatever that patient needs. And I think that's a key thing that I don't want people to just think that we just manipulate every single thing and that's all we do because that's just not accurate. There's a different profession that's failed with that model. Yeah, you're totally correct. It isn't true. And if we use it the way that other profession does, then, uh, then we can have a similar fate. But if we use it to enable getting that patient to rehab, getting that patient toward the door, uh, great. That's what it should be for. Right, right. And, you know, and kind of getting on to the issue now of kind of, I want to switch gears a little bit here and Tim, can kind of go more along the thoughts of clinical reasoning. Yeah. Um, I'm curious on what are your thoughts on how clinical reasoning is currently integrated into DPT programs across the U.S.? I think, you know, uh, the ones I've seen, now I see it in a entry-level circumstance. I see it in a residency circumstance. I see it in a fellowship circumstance. And here's the thing that I uh, see mostly uh, in the uh, entry-level. Uh, you can only talk about it, and they don't see it. They don't see it modeled. So it becomes sort of a buzz phrase clinical reasoning, i.e., my justification for why I did something. Well, it's the pathway. So if you get to a residency, ideally, you're watching that pathway, you're performing it, but if you're not getting immediate feedback from somebody who's done this, knows where you're going, knows what you're trying to do, then you're basically teaching yourself to get better and better at the same errors. And then I watch the fellowship programs, and the vast majority of uh, the fellowships are devoid of any clinical reasoning. Uh, I have uh, I've been either uh, dismissed from uh, some or uh, exited myself because I told them I could not let their students touch my patient. Uh, and the reason was there is absolutely no clinical reasoning, no rationale. Little plug for EIM, uh, mostly a plug, I think, for uh, Julie Whitman and Barb, my mentor, uh, is that they make it first and foremost the thing that people are doing. Uh, even there, the downside is you can't get into the clinic with everybody. So it's like right now we're talking through this computer screen. I can't reach over there and check your inferior glide. Uh, so what they're doing is trying to watch somebody basically make mistakes uh, and then school them through what the mistakes were, wait for them to do it again. So by the time they're all done, maybe they've done this eight or 10 times with different cases. Uh, that's not even the first day in the clinic, you know, eight or 10 times with patients. That's uh, ha halfway through the day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's the deficiency. And if people don't do what you said, that is, uh, take their mentor that's always with them, i.e. their own intellectual honesty, into the clinic with them every day, 
and insist that not only do they expect to see something happen with that patient, but they expect it now. They expect it now because I've thought this through very well, and here's what I expect to see happen. And then to pause, say, well, if I'm right, then my reassessment should look like this. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong, I've done enough clinical reasoning to get to where I was to know that, oh, here's the mistake I've made. Uh, that's the hard part for people to really be intellectually honest all the way through every time they're seeing a patient. Uh, nobody likes to look at their failures. So if you've done a lot of good thinking, you think, because otherwise, why would you come to a conclusion if you didn't believe it? And you're dead wrong. Uh, you better be able to retrench that and find a way that uh, you can make better decisions next time. I think because of the academic background, and not to pick on sports medicine people, but they're easy for this reason. Uh, there's an algorithmic drive in order to name the thing. Mm -hmm. And naming the thing doesn't help us at all, mm -hmm. right? What does help us is determine what's the behavior of that thing and how do I change the behavior? Mm -hmm. So I like to get uh, the, the students understanding that uh, we're not in the business of naming it. We're in the business of changing it. Mm -hmm. What have you seen about this particular presentation that you're now going to be able to change because of your selected treatment and what's your path there? Anytime you do any technique, you should be able to know that that did what you wanted to or it didn't. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't, where are you going to go next? Right. Uh, and for me, I think the ultimate skill in that is to know that that's what you can do uh, from STEM to CERN, i.e. intervention, rehab, management, prophylaxis. And, I, and that's where I think we as PTs as a profession totally fall down right now. I don't think we even remember what genuinely therapeutic exercise is. I think what we do is we send people out to uh, 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 relatively unskilled personnel to do exercise and call that therapeutic. Mm -hmm. The clinical reasoning process should be going through that same thinking, decision-making process about the exercise. There must be a rationale. And if so, then this is what the result will be. Right. And I know there's been a lot of push even too for a lot of students really wanting more formal exercise prescription in schools. Yeah. And I know that's been talked about for a long time. I'm going to defend the academicians for a moment because there'd be a lot of times I'm sure that I'm going to be uh, uh, besmirching them. In, in their environment, they're trapped. CAPTI tells them what they got to do and students have to exit uh, able to pass the exam. Uh, and that's their first and foremost job. Then... In their circumstance, the vast majority, there's very, very few uh, faculty practices, so the vast majority of faculty don't actually practice. Uh, so for therapeutic exercise, i.e., to be genuinely helpful for that particular person's behavior of a problem at this point in time, there isn't an index card or a drop down box on your computer to say that's the exercise that they should do. Uh, so they're kind of trapped in that they don't ever get put into that circumstance where they have to customize an exercise to get the patient from point B to point C. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's a tough challenge. If I ever went to a fa faculty uh, position, uh, that would be the only, I wouldn't say the only course, but that'd be my number one course I'd want to do because to me, it's embarrassing what I see Patients who've come from other clinics, uh, when they come to me and they, they show me the exercises uh, that a PT gave them, and it's, you know, it's just one step shy of the old Williams selection tear-off uh, uh, sheets as if that's going to solve their particular problem. Anyway, a little pass for the faculty on not being able to customize well, but no pass at all for not teaching basic principles of therapeutic exercise and teaching it in a way that the student is responsible for then customizing it, but they know those basic principles cold. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, that they know how to guide the body. So one of the things I'm a, a very strong advocate of uh, is falling away a lot, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. It works for orthopedic patients too, people. Uh, as one of my uh, mentors said, it only works for people with a neurosystem. So if you can facilitate the, uh, the patient's ability to do something that they need uh, and you understand all the basic concepts, you devise your own exercise. I do it all day.
Mm-hmm. And everybody ends up with a sort of, let's call it the middle of the bell shaped curve of things that they, they do because we all see common clinical syndromes. Uh, but then the fun part is when they come out to the narrow ends of the bell shaped curve uh, and they're different in one direction or another direction. And then you have to customize it very specifically for that individual. Yeah. No, I think those are really, really good points, Tim. And, you know, I'm curious since you've taken and worked with a lot of therapists, a lot of students in your career, from what you've learned and apart from what you've kind of already mentioned, what have you found to be the most effective ways to really foster clinical reasoning development in students? I think the best way is the most uncomfortable way uh, for the student. Uh, uh, You know, maybe I'm saying this, that this is how I really got it. I was a student, I had to front up for a mentor about what it is I was thinking, why I was thinking it, justify it, uh, pare it down almost my rationale for severity, irritability, nature stage, and stability of the patient at that point in time, and to do it in front of my patient uh, so that my patient then uh, understood that our conversation wasn't casual, it was about them and how to get them from point A to point B. Uh, and then uh, probably the uh, Second best is to uh, then debrief with the uh, the student. Uh, I'll use me as a student uh, afterwards. Uh, if uh, my mentor would ask me, okay, why did you choose this? And what were you thinking about the irritability? Were you willing to push that knowing full well that this might take four hours to settle down and why? Uh, I think the only way to really do it is you, you have to be placed into uh, – into the position where you, the precipice of the decision is going to be, uh, it's going to be a thumbs up or a thumbs down, or you never really push yourself to think that way. Uh, so I, I think it's the only way to really do it. I don't think you can, uh, uh, you can't really do it all by yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you try and do it all by yourself, you know what you do is uh, at some point or another, everybody's got a schedule, everybody's got a time clock kick, ticking in the back of their head, and you start sort of hurrying up your way through it. Uh, ideally, a residency would be where the uh, the individual has more time with a uh, uh, with a patient with a mentor overseeing, so that they can. Uh, uh, make mistakes, and somebody gave me a T-shirt once. Uh, a patient of mine gave me the T-shirt, said, "I'll make better mistakes tomorrow." There you go. <laughs> and that's exactly so. You yeah. got to be willing to make the error, but willing to analyze why you made it and improve upon that the next okay. time. Right. I always love the quote: "An error is not a mistake until you, if, until you, unless you refuse to correct it." Yeah, and it's exactly so. I don't think you ever learn as well. Uh, as you do from your mistakes, I'll put it this way. Your successes have very little to teach you. Mm-hmm. Your failures, on the other hand, if, if you look past them, you're missing the opportunity to grow and you'll be stuck with only succeeding with those types of things that you succeeded with before and not the one you just failed with. I guess I can say, uh, you know, your, uh, your beliefs are demonstrated by that which you do. And so uh, here's what I do when I'm teaching uh, to uh, anybody who's taking uh, continuing education classes with me. I film patients. I film patients, me seeing the patient. I have live uh, video of, of me going through a patient. And then uh, uh, because Barb, my mentor, Stevens, likes to use him with EIM's uh, instructional uh, circumstances for her classes, uh, she makes these brilliant PowerPoints that that basically dissect. She knows me well enough because she basically raised me uh, that she'll dissect uh, and put in there what he was thinking at this point, at this point, at this point, at this point, right? And then my job is to edit and correct it if it's uh, something that uh, I disagreed with. I rarely have to edit, uh, uh, but I do think let's just take, uh, not everybody has that advantage and she's uh, got the, uh, the PowerPoint thing down, but the videotape of actually watching a patient so that uh, students can watch that and let's just take, because the clinical reasoning, it's not just the subjective examination. Mm-hmm. If they're watching the subjective examination, uh, I always say the subjective exam is over when the next most important question is going to be only answered objectively. So at that point, you should have a, uh, a working hypothesis, uh, and you should have a series of other hypotheses in the event that you're wrong. And your objective exam 
becomes uh, about trying to prove, I should say, support or not support your working hypothesis. So during the pieces that happen in a subjective exam, students can be uh, asked to say, well, what were they thinking? Justify that. Why? Uh, at the end of the subjective examination, they should be able to, A, draw the body chart of that patient, B, have a presentation of that patient already written out in their minds, and then C, be able to say, because of that, the objective exam will be structured this way, right? When people really commit to doing that, uh, they sort of put their cell, they put their heads inside of the head of the examiner, the uh, more experienced clinician, and then they need to be able to do the same thing in the objective exam. So the objective exam is over when the next most important question is answered by a trial treatment threshold. And so if it's supported, then something happens in a positive direction. And if it doesn't, then uh, it's not supported. You have to start thinking about, geez, where did I make this mistake? Uh, but, but I think that's the closest you can get in the absence of having a, uh, a mentor, an eye in the sky, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, you, people have to be willing to front up. That is, you got to be willing to put yourself on a video and put that in front of students and be willing to have them dissect it. Mm -hmm. uh, and know that some, I, you know, as of yet, you know, I'm 40 years in a clinic now. I'm trying to remember the perfect case I did. Uh, it must have been an acute facet lock that took about two seconds worth of thinking. Uh, but otherwise, they're, none of them are perfect. Every time I watch one, I learn something watching me because I'm self-critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so if teachers are willing to do that and put that out in front of students and, and then walk them through what they're thinking, I think that's the closest you enable them prior to them getting into clinic. Yeah. And even like Jeff Moore had mentioned when I was at one of his courses, how he would even videotape himself through evaluation stuff. And I think it's a good point that what you think you say or what you think happened is yeah. may not always the same as what actually happened when you review the tape. Yeah, it's very funny. I had the opportunity to be one of his instructors when he was going through the fellowship. And, and you know, Jeff's a great communicator. Uh, and uh, what he was doing and what the patient was receiving were totally different in the patient's and that uh, the practitioner's mindset. Uh, and Jeff was one of the first to decide, I'm changing this. I'm changing this. I think sometimes like we don't even realize habits. I mean, because I think that that's why I like having mentors. One of the one of the additional reasons why I like having mentors, because I think having an objective third party who's really looking at you as well to maybe point out some things that perhaps you just weren't aware of. Like, do you know you do this? Do you know you do this? Or you say this a lot? Like, actually, no, I really hadn't because I've been used to doing this for so long. But some, so I think there's definitely some value to that. It's humbling. Uh, people have to uh, be uh, willing to get humbled. Uh, and, you know, some people can just do it this way. Film themselves, like what you just finished saying. Yeah? Film yourself, go home, watch the film, and be prepared to pull out a drink because you're not going to like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you uh, start to see that and you recognize it the next day in the clinic, you can be, you know, self-tutaling. So you get yourself to advance yourself because you're being honest with yourself. No, I think that's, that's very, very true. So something that I kind of want to get your thoughts on with you doing a lot of teaching and stuff, and I kind of want to break it down into kind of more lab-based learning for student format here. So in, from your thoughts, what are the most effective methods either in a lab or class to best foster development and refinement of psychomotor skills? I think the best lab is... Uh... <laughs> an understanding before the arrival at the lab so that you're not squandering time uh, because it's a psychomotor skill. Uh, if you're going to get better at hitting a baseball, uh, you want to take reps at the baseball with a bat in your hands. Uh, but you, ne you need to understand what's the ball, what's the bat. Oh, this guy's going to throw it and the ball's going to come in the air and it's going to come at what kind of speed, etc. cetera. Uh, so, uh, in in my classes, people watch all of the all the lectures are flip lectures. So when they walk in the door, everything is hands on. Uh, we might start off with, "Are there any questions?" But let's go right to what you said. That is about the uh, uh, the pragmatics of running a good lab. Uh, and let's go back and just be honest that everybody's got to get the mechanics first. Okay, so. 
first, I think that sort of a, uh, a necessity that individuals see what they think they know. Uh, so they see it demonstrated. And then I think there's a great value in really mechanizing it at the beginning with, okay, everybody do as I'm doing right here and break it down. We'll go back to the same example. Let's take uh, OA. So I'm going to side bend it a little bit to the left. I'm going to rotate it a little bit to the right. And I want you to stop right there. Go backwards. Did you pass the uh, this, did you move out of the side bending? Did you close it up when you went into the rotation? If so, you're going to miss the ability to move that. I want you to move that and stop. Move that and stop. Move that and stop. And what I should have said before that really is position the patient for comfort so you're going to succeed. Position the therapist in a comfortable position for body mechanics so that the potential is there and that you don't have to be thinking about those two things. You're thinking about what you're doing then. And then I think it's really valuable to rotate from there. Don't even thrust. Move from there, set it up, go to the next person. Rotate so you got group A and group B. Rotate to a new body because they all feel different to go to that next body, set up the same thing, and then find the end feel, and then rotate, go to the next body, set up the same thing, and then find the end feel, and then just sort of push at the end of it, and then rotate and go to the next body until you get people used to doing the same thing in a repetitive fashion till they're dying to go ahead through with the whole uh, technique. Okay, now then go through uh, in that instance of thrust uh, and then the flip flop and then to continue their practicing uh, with different bodies, same technique uh, until they really get used to it being almost like, here's one of the things that I do to uh, students. I put blindfolds on them. I put blindfolds on them for a palpatory examination. So they know where their hands are and they're not questioning that. Uh, and if they can then do that same setup with the blindfold on, right, they start to get more and more comfortable when suddenly, oh, I'm allowed to look, and they can take their blindfolds off. And uh, uh, it's, uh, there is a mechanization to it, and I think if people get uh, used to building that, whatever it is, uh, name the technique, uh, uh, that they do it repeatedly with different bodies uh, and with progressively less and less time, there's value to doing that. And I really like how you kind of said and how kind of breaking down each component of that technique. So really like mastering one different body parts and then kind of moving up. It's very easy to miss something like that and not find the right way to start off with. And then everything else is just done. Right. What you want to do is get it so that uh, like a golfer doesn't stand up and think about all the things he's practiced. He's practiced them. Mm -hmm. He stands up, he goes to his stance and he hits the golf ball. Right, as opposed to what he might do with a coach and they break it down with all the pieces, break mm -hmm. it down before you get into the circumstance. Yeah. And, you know, Tim, I'd like to kind of switch a little bit and talk about evidence. You know, one thing I've got to ask, because we've been talking about clinical reason, we've been talking about um, psychomotor skill development. Um, one thing that I'm just really curious about just to kind of find out, is there any evidence that really talks about um, optimal methods for enhancing clinical reasoning or psychomotor skill development that you're aware of? Oh, there's a bevy of uh, material out there right now. Uh, there's nothing that's persuaded me that uh, what I've uh, uh, said so far is different. That is that the people who uh, invest their time into actually doing it, uh, those are the people who will get it. Uh, so there's a bevy of evidence out there. Uh, everybody has to understand that evidence is uh, an answerable question. Uh, so it's got its limitations uh, and it's got its value. I'm a huge fan, huge. All the researchers out there listening to this, hear me loud and clear. I love you. I love what you're doing. What I don't love is how it's consumed. All research should be consumed with the same analytical mindset that those who did the research put into their work. So we should be looking to see, A, is this valid? B, is it generalizable? Uh, and C, uh, is that the only factor I have to look at when I'm, uh, when I'm looking at patients? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, but if, if, if you want to get uh, a lot of reading, uh, go ahead and do a PubMed search on clinical reasoning, and, and you'll have a, a pile of things to uh, read for a long period of time. 
Very good. And Tim, you know, kind of curious on this one here, because I know we had kind of talked in the pre-show about this and you kind of were one of the few that actually said, I know exactly where I'm going to go with this. So the question that I kind of want to finish off this episode with is kind of one that we ask every guest, because at the end of the day, this podcast is called the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Yeah. So with that being said, if, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, whether that be DPT or otherwise, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Okay, this is easy for me. It's got multiple prongs. However, uh, it's very, very clear to me that right now uh, what we have failed to do is acknowledge that there's a difference between knowledge and skill. Uh, physical therapy, I always like to say it's an, in, it's an artistic application of the intellect. To come armed in the clinic with nothing but the intellect and the things that we gain from an academic setting, from research information, and to walk in the clinic and expect to excel is flat out moronic. To go uh, and develop nothing but skill without that knowledge is useless. Uh, so those two things, uh, there, there's, a, there's a chasm between them. And I think with the obvious thing that's missing is that we don't have adequate hands-on skill set training. I know academicians out there are listening and thinking, oh, sure we do because we're counting on the clinicians for that in their nine-month uh, clinical rotations. I want to know the last time anybody went in to see what it was that was being delivered in those clinical settings. They have no idea what they're doing is they're trying to place a body, and I'm empathetic with that. They've got X number of students who all need to have a place to go to, and they have no idea what they're getting out there. And we are so fragmented as a profession that there's no way to guarantee what it is that they're getting. You know, what we know for sure is that, oh, it sounded good that we should have uh, – that we should have an evidence-based practice. Well, I think what's happened is instead of it being an evidence-based practice, what's happening is that a lot of uh, people are being forced into an evidence-driven model where there isn't any thinking, knowing what the evidence says, knowing what the academics have said, and then applying it to that individual in front of us right now. And I don't think we're ever going to change if we don't find the, the way to get legitimate clinical training, and you can't get it from the researchers, you can't get it from the academicians, I'm going to throw it out at the clinicians. Do you really care about the profession? Then what are you doing to try and elevate the skill set of those who are going to take over the profession from here forward from the time that you leave? Uh, because you don't get that skill. Uh, there's no violinist that learned to play a violin well without somebody who could play the violin well, schooling them along the way. And I think what we need to do is uh, we need to stop this business of thinking that it's all about what we do with academics. I really and truly think that the uh, the doctoral transition has been a failure. I think what's happened there is you got a jobs program for academicians, and you don't have students coming out with a better skill set to enable them to walk in the clinic and know that I can help you. Not that I can talk to you, not that I can explain your problem, but I have the skill set to be able to do something. Until we bridge that gap, uh, we're going to have a lot of frustrated students exiting school, entering a clinic, and wishing they knew what to do for patients. Yeah, and I mean, it's definitely a, been a huge debated topic throughout you know, professional organizations and academics as well. And there's also a lot of work that's been going on looking at clinical education, just advancing education from, you know, from ACAPs doing their numerous panels and task courses, but then also the APTA with their best practice or physical therapist clinical education task force, but all, and also the ELP, the Education and Leadership Partnership. So there's a lot of effort and work that's being done to examine this and do something about this as well. Yeah, you know, I would ask everybody to think about it. Uh, the clinical educators have what stake in the game? Not much, not unless they're altruistic, right? So in that last year where students are paying tuition, right, and yet they're not on campus, they're going to various clinical settings, why doesn't that tuition go to motivate those clinicians, those who are delivering a good job? Why don't they pay them to spend the time with the students? I know the answer because the administrators of the academic institutions, they want to keep that the revenue. They're counting on that money. Uh, and you know what? Uh, that's, you know, pardon the, the, uh, the, I'll say it nicer. 
that's pillaging the future of the profession for the present in order to gratify those who are in that circumstance. And it is forcing all of those students to then come out and look later and think, where do I go now? I need to learn something. Motivate the clinical uh, educators and, and you'll find a big change. If you don't, then you take that, 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 those funds away from them. If they're not delivering, if they're not clearly seeing uh, students coming out with better clinical skills from going to that particular facility, uh, then they're off the payroll. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that will get them to have a stake in the game. Uh, and I think that's one thing. I'm sure there's many other ideas, but, you know, let's start doing some of the ideas because just all yeah. through them is only working in small circles. And I'm not entirely sure how much of that extra financial gain that the universities get from, you know, students when they're on their clinical affiliations. Cause from when I've talked with faculty members, they've, they've, my understanding is that, you know, the program doesn't set tuition in terms of what's being done with that. Personally, that's above, that's above the program. That's the financial department within the university. Cause you know, frankly, in my school, my program director, God bless her, she actually fought adamantly so that we didn't have to, to pay tuition because we actually had tuition waived for our last semester when we were on clinical affiliation. So, and she really fought every single year to protect that so that students wouldn't have to pay that extra tuition money. It's interesting that how it's been talk about should they have a furthering development program for clinical instructors to be better effective educators. And this idea is in addition to the APTA's credentialed clinical instructor programs. And this idea is kind of more like a continuum of development for clinical educators. To kind of help maybe address that education component, which, but it seems logical to me to help better teach clinicians that want to be educators how to do it effectively given the constraints to really help the student. Yeah, and if they do that, what they really need to do is they need to have people have expertise in two ways. A, education. B, as a clinician. Mm -hmm. An educator can only deliver that which they know. Unless you've got a, uh, an educator who's got a clinical capacity, uh, I'll just throw out a name because everybody knows this name in the APTA, uh, and you're, you're, there you are in Virginia. Bill Boysenalt spent plenty of time in the clinic, uh, and he's a great educator. Uh, that kind of person, and no, no disparaging Bill, but he's been out of the clinic a long time. He might not like the role, you know, but there are those people that uh, have, let's say, 20 years of clinical experience, and they're interested in education. Uh, that's the kind of person we need, not just somebody who's just a clinician yeah. who doesn't know how to educate. That was me when I first started teaching. Thankfully, somebody uh, had tutelage along the way about becoming an educator, a totally different skill set, and not just somebody who's only an educator yeah. uh, because they don't get it. And I don't care how much they think it through, their hands don't get it, and they have an interface in a clinic the way that uh, the people need to do who are in the trenches. Right. And then that's all. And then the, the challenge to that is really trying to find, like, what's that level of credibility? Like, how do we objectively determine that someone's able to do that? You know, and then, A, having the supply right. for schools to be able to pull that off. Yeah, it's a big challenge. I get that. But, you know, the... Uh, Otherwise, uh, what we're doing is we're running a risk of creating a world full of theorists, uh, people who can solve problems in their minds, uh, but not pro solve problems in the patient's bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, there's an old book, Atlas Shrugged, about uh, the world uh, being run by those who uh, were theoretical, uh, sort of the first uh, poke at the ivory tower, but they couldn't actually do it. And so all mm -hmm. the people who could do it decided, you know what? Let's just leave. Mm -hmm. And of course, that theoretical world falls apart. So if we don't do something to change that, we're setting ourselves up for a, uh, a fallacy, uh, something that, we, uh, that exists only in our minds. Yeah. And you know what? Patients will figure that out. You know, maybe one of the worst things that ever happened to, uh, to good physical therapy is insurance reimbursement. Because if I give you bad coffee and you give me good money, you're probably not coming back. If I give you bad care and you give me good money, you're probably not coming back, right? That would elevate the stake in the game for the providers. Yeah, and I'm not saying that's totally realistic, but, but we're not being realistic right now about 
taking a young student. Uh, here you are three years out. Uh, I dare say you've moved, uh, without knowing you, you've learned more in the last three years actually treating patients than you did in those three years of school. Mm -hmm. No disparaging of that information that you got in school. You needed it. Mm -hmm. but to be, a, be a clinician, you learned more in the last three years than you did in those three. I agree. But then it's also hard because it's like, is the, then there's the experiential learning. Are you going to gain more, you know, doing the thing than just reading about it too? And I'm not oh. a learning theorist by any means, but you know, it, it makes sense. Cause I know we had one, one educator on and she's like, she was more of an academician. And when she's like, and students would come back from the clinic and they're like, Oh, I learned so much. And she's like, well, you didn't learn anything from me, but she's like, but, but the reason they learn so much is because that's that type of learning environment. Like they're going to learn better and more in that setting because they see it, they apply yeah. it, you know, they can talk through it. I mean, it's, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. I was, uh, I was given this, uh, uh, Keltenborn Award uh, through the Academy, and I made a little uh, talk because that's what you have to do. Uh, and I gave a little uh, analogy of this, uh, uh, that it's a three-legged stool. Uh, there's academics, uh, there's research, and then there's clinic, right? And upon that three-legged stool stands the platform of the profession, right? All three legs are critical, and there's only one leg that without which there is no profession. Right. So if people aren't actually delivering in the clinic, uh, then the other two uh, legs are going to be looking for something else to do. All three are important. People have to uh, uh, get it that uh, what you got to try and do is elevate your end of it, knowing that you're going towards the platform, not just the leg. You know, be a good solid leg, but elevate the profession, not just your leg. Mm -hmm. No, I think those are really, really good points, Tim. And I wanted to thank you for coming on today because I've definitely learned quite a bit of stuff. And I really think this is going to be valuable to the listeners as well. So thank Great. you so much for your time and for everything. Uh, where, If people have a question for you, they want to learn more or anything like that, where can they kind of follow up with you if they have a question on anything? Uh, I think uh, the easiest thing, uh, phoenixmanualtherapy.com, that's my educational arm, and I believe my email is on there, but I'll, I'll throw it out right now. It's T like Timothy, O like Owen, F like Frank, uh, T-O-F-P-T uh, at mac.com. Uh, but the website probably give you a better view of uh, what it is that I do, and the, and the uh, email is on there as well. Well, perfect, Tim. Again, thanks so much for your time, for everything, your service. Always a pleasure. Brandon, it's my uh, intent to leave the profession better than when I arrived, and I hope everybody that's listening to this does the same thing. Then we've done something useful. Amen to that. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere healthcare a telehealth platform is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.